This talk is, is partially a case study. Uh, I'm, using, I'm basically using the LLVM compiler as a case study, but the talk really is not about the compiler. I'm going to be talking about the problem that I ran into in working on the LLVM backend and how I solved the problem and describing the template magic that made it possible. Uh, so I first have to describe it, but like I said, it's not about compiler. You don't need to know about compilers in order, in order to understand this talk. At the end of this talk, what my hope is, is that you'll understand something about the techniques like using const expert, meta programming, template uh, expressions, and embedded domain specific languages. So this, like I said, you guys are the elite. You're the ones who came to a talk that is flagged as being for uh, experts or advanced uh, programmers. So, you know, this is to make you feel like really scared, uh, you know, that's really meta. There's, I'm gonna be skipping around. It's also the, the end of the third day of CppCon, which means, of course, the energy is probably kind of flagging. But pay attention, this is a difficult talk. My hope by saying all this is that by the end of the talk, you'll say, oh, I understood that. I must be really smart. <laughs> a little bit about me. Um, I'm a compiler developer at Intel, uh, and I've been a member of the C++ Standards Committee for, since about 2006 or so. Uh, this is my fifth uh, year presenting at CppCon. CppCon is, this is the fifth CppCon, so I've been doing it from the beginning. And I drive a really nerdy car. Now, what makes this car nerdy? Anybody? It's a Prius. That's why it's nerdy. Oh, oh you're probably looking at the license plate wondering what it says. It says, New Hampshire, live free or die. <laughs> so let me introduce the problem I needed to solve. This is a simple uh, C or C++ program. It doesn't, you know, I, it's kind of made up, for an, a kind of made up example for, the, for this talk. But we have a little function that computes um, AX plus Y. Uh, and in the middle, it also increments the value pointed to by P. The interesting thing about this example is that the, the value that we compute at the beginning, the AX value, is used in the third line to compute the return value of the function. Why is that interesting? Well, when this is compiled by Clang, it produces this intermediate representation. This is the machine intermediate representation, which is, which is to say the compiler has produced an intermediate representation, and then it has gone through instruction selection and it is now x86 code, but it's still in the LLVM format. So the LLVM tools can still be used on it. And so for those of you who do not work in the LLVM code base, that's what this means. It does look like assembly language, that's, that's, that's intentional. This is what happens when you take that internal data structure and you dump it for debugging purposes, typically. And the way you read it is that the output registers are to the left. So we have our percent four, on the left there, uh, and the instruction and the input operands are on the right of the equal. If there's no output operands, then there's no equal sign, no equal operator. The interesting thing about this particular code snippet, well, first of all, at this point, you can see there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input lines and the output. Of course, that's pretty rare when compiling something down to assembly language, but my input example was, was selected to be easy to understand here. So we have our first instruction is the multiply instruction. Our second instruction is the increment of the, uh, of the star p. And then the third instruction is our add instruction that takes the ax and adds y to it. On modern Intel CPUs, there's an instruction called fused multiply add, a single instruction that multiplies two operands and adds a third. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to use it here since we're doing exactly that? The increment of star p in the middle has no effect on this because nothing depends on it. The, the, the output of the ax plus y is not dependent on star p, so we can reorder the instructions and not, not worry about it. So what we would like to do is recognize this pattern of, oh, we have two operands going into multiply, the output of the multiply goes into an add, and replace that pattern with a fuse multiply add. This is how we would find that pattern using 
the tools of the uh, LLVM toolkit. Now, it, it, if this looks like an eye chart to you, that's kind of deliberate. I wanted to show what it would look like if I squeeze this all onto one slide. I'm not going to go through it line by line. What's important here is that the, the logic is we are simply walking the call graph, or not the call graph, but the data flow graph here down in the lower right. The data flow graph shows the two input operands going into the multiply, the output of that going to the add, and that's the only part of the pattern we care about. So what we're doing is we're just checking to see if the instruction we were given is one of the multiply instructions we recognize, and there are four in our if statement, which I, you know, I don't have a good angle here for the laser pointer, but you can see that first if statement at the very top is checking four different opcodes to see if it's one of those. And then if it is, we descend and we just, do, just doing ifs and, and for loops to, to look at things. What happens is if we find the multiply instruction, we have to iterate over all of the outputs, all of the, sorry, all of the consumers of the register that is produced from the multiply to see if one of them is an add. And what's important there is that there's a backtracking step that is not completely obvious, um, but is here right in the middle, where if we find an, uh, we find an, uh, an instruction that is consuming the result of the multiply, but that instruction is not the add instruction, we don't give up. We, we now look for the next consumer of the, multiply, of the output of the multiply. And while this example is particularly simple, and in fact, we probably should give up the minute we find something that's not an add, uh, in, in a more general case, it's very easy to forget to do that backtracking step. And in fact, the first time I wrote, not this code, but the but real code that was trying to do some pattern matching, that was an error I made, and my test case didn't show it. It wasn't until somewhat later that I discovered, oh, there might be more than one consumer, so if the first one doesn't match, I have to go back and try the next one. And it was, it was a recursive situation because we're walking a graph, and in a recursive situation, it's really important to be able to, to backtrack when necessary. So, number of reasons why this code is kind of ugly. And it's not even the ugliest code in the world. It's, it's really not that bad, but this is a very small example. Uh, it, it, it's error prone. It's a fair amount of code for doing very little work. Um, and so it seems to me like, well, you should be able to replace this with some kind of table lookup or something like that, right? Do you have a question? Oh, machine intermediate representation. So LLVM has two intermediate representations. One is portable, it's unrelated to what architecture you're compiling for, and the other is the machine specific one. This code is for the machine specific one. MRI. Oh, MRI. Yeah. Where is that? MRI does use Oh, okay. Yeah, this is LLVM infrastructure, yeah, yeah. the machine register information, I think it is, something like that. I don't remember what all the acronyms are. There are a set of uh, data structures in LLVM that you use all over the place, and they tend to have the same name everywhere you use it so you remember what it is. And MRI is one of those. And there's also TII, and there's you know um, things that, that tell you something about the instruction set or about the register set or something like that. Um, and in this case, the MRI is, is uh, yes, yeah, the machine register information, so it's the database, effectively, of what's connected to what. Okay, so I was saying, wouldn't it be nice to use some kind of table-driven approach like this? And I immediately started thinking, what would that table look like? And you realize it's kind of irregular to fit into a table. Some things have more operands, have, some things have fewer operands. What would that look like? I would need to use some sort of templated data structure inside of my table but it would be kind of polymorphic and that would be getting kind of ugly. So instead I thought, what about expression templates? Expression templates are these places where you build up these expressions using templates and the, and the result is something that you execute, but the intermediate results are something that is just a, like an empty data structure. So I came up with this syntax. This is basically an expression template, but taken to the nth order that does exactly what the previous slide did. As you can see, I'm using a bigger font. The first two uh, declarations are basically 
uh, things that you would declare once saying, these are groups of opcodes that I care about and I want to give them a name. So the moles and adds are the different multiply instructions and add instructions that I care about. And then this line here that says mirror matcher regs declares names for the registers that I'm going to use in my pattern. Now, first of all, this is the only place I was I resorted to using macros, and I tried mightily to resist using a macro. And it's not too ugly if I were to unbundle this and to make it a non-macro, there would be four declarations of registers uh, with types numbered one, two, three, and four. Um, but this seemed a little easier. It looks, it makes it more look more like I'm enumerating the registers, which is exactly what I'm doing. I'm enumerating them. These names have no meaning except within the local context. Uh, so that I can name things within my pattern. And they, but they represent registers in the uh, instruction set. And then the, the real heart of what's going on is this declaration of FMA pattern, which is a graph, so it's a, it's a data flow graph, saying we have an instruction that is a multiply, it takes any operand as the first operand, it takes reg x as the second operand, it produces a register that we name reg, reg AX as output. And then the second instruction we care about is the adds instruction. And the important thing is that it takes reg AX, um, which is the same as the output of the multiply instruction. And therefore, they're con connected in a data flow graph. And it produces our product here, our uh, AX plus Y. And then once we've defined this pattern, which notice it's a const x per object, and it is completely produced at compile time, and it is um, empty. That is, it's, it's one byte in size because there are no such thing as zero-sized objects. Otherwise, it would be zero-sized. Um, and then we pass that to our match function, which is where the, the actual runtime work happens. So the, this, this last line, the very last line of code, is the only thing that executes at runtime. Everything above that is compile time. So that's kind of cool. So, the idea was to build this kind of language so that it's, it's an embedded language, in, but it's done entirely in C++. So I can just describe my pattern like this. And then uh, I hope you agree that this is a lot easier to read and a lot easier to modify uh, than the previous slide here. Um, so. <clears throat> After we've done our match, we actually need to do the transformation, right? The actual replacing of the add and multiply with the FMA instruction, the fuse multiply add. Uh, and this logic does that. And this is not using the, the mer matcher, except it's using the result. In the previous uh, case, we're returning something. And the thing that we're returning is a special result. Sorry, we're passing in a result structure, which is our output. output uh, uh, data structure that contains the results of our match. And it returns a Boolean saying, did it match or not? There's a, there are a couple of overloads of this, but I won't get to that, into that. So we're using the result here to make the substitution. I, I don't need to go through this because it's, it's not the, really the purpose of the talk to go into how the compiler works. But what's important is the, the well, the if statement on the outside is simply to make sure that the, the, use of our um, multiply instruction is used only by the add instruction. And that's what that's telling us. Because if there are other uses of it, we can't do the substitution. We would, throw, we would end up throwing away the result for other uses of it. But, in then, then, but how, did, how does that work is we have uh, this result.reg, which extracts the actual virtual register in the LVM machine IR system that is produced by that instruction. And we make sure that it has only one use. So result.reg takes the same name that we used over here to describe the result of our multiply instruction. And the result, uh, the, the, next, the next thing, result.instr, you give it exactly the same instruction, meaning spelled exactly the same as we used here, 
to say what is the actual instruction, the pointer to the instruction in, in the data structures of the compiler that matched the that matched in our in our match. Okay. And so we do that here, we do that here, and we do it uh, three more times. Down here we get the registers there. So there's a direct correspondence between the names we gave things in our matching language and the results we get out of the successful match. And that is basically the, the introduction to the solution that I came up with to the problem I was trying to solve. So these were my design goals. It had to support cycles. Programs have loops. Loops result in cycles in the data flow graph. I need to be able to match those cycles. Uh, the embedded language should look as much as possible like the assembly language we're trying to match, or the intermediate representation we're trying to match. Um, we have to be able to ac access part, the, the subparts of our match. It's not good enough to say, yes, it matched. We actually say, which instructions matched, which registers matched. We don't want runtime dispatch, virtual functions, switch statements as much as we can avoid them. Um, there are going to be ifs in the thing. There are going to be some things that may compile to a switch because that's required for doing a match. But we don't want to say uh, run a little interpreter at runtime if we can avoid it. We want it to compile down to a constant expression so it can be baked into the executable. Compiled, done, all you're doing is doing the actual match. So basically generate that one page of code that I showed at the beginning uh, using this little language but it's code, it goes gone to object code. And did I mention about cycles? It's got to support cycles. Now I say that twice, I emphasize that because there is a pattern matcher in the LLVM infrastructure. It's for the portable IR, but the idea is the same. But it only works by, you give it a expressions and sub-expressions and sub-expressions and, and it forms a tree. It doesn't represent an arbitrary graph and it certainly can't represent cycles. And that's, that. That gave me two problems. One is it made it hard to represent, to, to reason about the actual parts of the match. Um, it does give you access to that stuff, but it, I think a little bit counterintuitively. And, but more importantly, it did not support cycles. In fact, it didn't even support fork join. It, had, it was just a tree. I mean, it supported a fork join, but you, when, when, when you come back together, you have to separately say, did it come back to the same instruction or to two different instructions? Um, because all it can represent is a tree. And why is it that it could only represent the trees? Because it was one expression. It just showed one expression, and the expression's parsed out to trees. So here's an example of where we need a cycle. We have a loop, and the loop has a couple of induction variables. So induction variables are the ones that just get incremented every time through the loop. They, they, they vary linearly with the loop iteration. We have our main induction variable, which is our loop control variable, and we have a second one, A, that we care about for some reason. When that's compiled down, we get uh, the intermediate representation for the body of the loop looks something like this. And I've highlighted in, the same, in, in red the, and green the things that, that are modifications on A. Now, for those of you who don't understand compilers, the fee instructions, which are the first two instructions, are basically just a funnel. Two, two things come in, one thing goes out. Um, that's all you really need to know to understand this talk. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an important part of compiler technology with uh, static single assignment, uh, but we, you don't need to fully understand it for this. Um, at the bottom, we have our addition instructions, and as you can see, the output in green is, is the same as the input on the top of the, of the um, instruction set, instruction list, that says, oh, well, we have this graph, where we we're, have two things going into the fee, what the output of the fee goes into addition instruction. We have a constant two that gets fed into the addition instruction. And we have a cycle where it goes back up to the fee. So we have to be able to match this, this cycle. We do that with this simple uh, code. And here again, you can see that the, uh, that the output of the first instruction is the input to the second instruction in our cycle. And the output of the, that second instruction is the input to the first instruction. Hence, the cycle is represented there. And when I was trying to figure out what kind of syntax I wanted to use for here, I made this observation that in order to represent the cycle, you have to name things. Because you have to be able to name something before you've used it. And then use it, and you produce it, and then use it 
and produce it again, and it has to be named. So we, we name everything here. Our, our registers are named. And uh, that was a, the re part of the reason why the other pattern matcher wasn't sufficient. Nothing was named there. Everything was anonymous. So this talk is now about compilers. So what does all this have to do with the price of tea in China? This is the price of tea in China, by the way. This is real data. And this is when Mermatcher was introduced, so you can draw your own conclusions about <laughs> the, the effect. But the point is, I want to show my journey to getting to being able to implement something like this, this embedded language, using straight C++, C++ 11. There is no C++ 14 or 17 in this. So a few, a few features of C++ 14 would have been useful. Probably some things in C++ 17, if I really think about it. But, but C++ 11 did most of the work for us. All of it, actually, because it works in C++ 11. So let's get to how it works. That's the, the main thing about the talk. We're using the C++ template language as our metaprogramming language. So to un you need to understand things about the, the template language, the stuff that runs at compile time, is that it's pretty much a functional language. And by functional language, well, it's Turing complete, which any kind of functional language should be. Uh, it, it uses immutable variables, and I put that in quote because we're not really using variables per se, but the things that, that work as if they were variables are immutable. You, you assign them once, you initialize them, and you never give them new values. Uh, and you express logical things that you might use loops for in normal C++. In the template language, you have to use recursion to get, get that effect. Now, the transition you have to think about is that types, when you're doing metaprogramming, types are what you use to represent values. Um, so for example, to get a Boolean value, you use two types, true type and false type instead of the actual values, true and false. So instead of variables, we use type depths. Because if you use variables to hold values, what do you use to hold types? Type depths. Now, you might think, well, what about constructs for vari variables? They, they're compile time, right? Yes. And you can use them in metaprogramming to a limit. But you can't overload on constructs for values. That is, the va you can't overload on values at all. Overloading is only on types. And you can't express uh, things like structs and lists using constructs for right now. You can't, exp you, can't, you can't describe a struct of something, declare it constructs for it, and have the compiler be able to extract fields from it at compile time. I think we'll get there eventually, but that's not part of the standard now, and certainly wasn't in 2011. The main mechanism we're using to get our syntax is, is operator overloading. So this is our little parse tree, if you will, of a single instruction match. We are doing the multiply instruction, and we're passing in this any operand as the first argument and regex as the second. I'll mention just in passing, because, but it's not critical for the talk. Eventually, we, I hope to be able to handle commutative operands automatically. Right now, this will match any operand on the left and the register on the right, but it should also handle a register on the left and any operand on the right, whatever. Uh, eventually we'll get there, but this is still kind of early in, the, in early days for this uh, package. Okay. Um, and the output is, is, has to go in reg AX. At the first level, all of the, in, all of the identifiers in this line of code are constants. They are constants of each one is a constant of a different type. So the first one, the, the register AX, uh, is, is of type register uh, instantiated on two. And the, the other register in the, in the thing, reg, reg X, is register instantiated on one. Now, how did they get those numbers? Well, remember that macro? That was to assign them each unique number. That was the whole purpose. So you could do it manually, but you just have to remember don't make the mistake of accidentally duplicating a number. Um, it would be relatively harmless to skip a number, but it would, it would take up extra space. Uh, so, so the macro kind of saves you from all that, and you can declare up to 20 registers. And because they're localized, they're only used for the, 
for generating a specific pattern, and then you can use a whole new set for getting the next pattern match. 20 should be enough for most uses. Okay, uh, so, so these, the other two parts, again, they're all constants. There's an opcode constant for the multiply instruction, and there is an any operand t constant for our any operand. So everything is a different type. The, the highest precedent operation here is a function call. But wait a minute, it's not really a function call. It's calling operator paren, which is a function call, but it's, a, it's an operator overload. The, the, the opcode template has an operator paren, and it's used, it's given those two operands uh, and produces this um, instruction as the result. And then that instruction is the right side of an operator equal, which is uh, a member of the register template, and it produces another instruction. So the difference between these two instructions, they are different types, as you can see. This one, there's no outputs encoded in it, and this one does have the outputs all encoded in it. So this is the instruction that will actually be used in the match. So the critical thing here to note is that every step of our operator overloading is producing another type, an object of another type. The, the, there's no state involved, it's only the type that matters. So all of these objects are empty objects, they have no member variables. So a little bit more on that. Uh, the embedded syntax is made possible by operator overloading. And each instruction, each operator invocation produces a, an object of unique type, and the objects are empty. They don't have to be empty. This is something that eventually I may relax that constraint, but the, it, things you want to be able to, comp to evaluate with a very small comp um, constructor if it's not going to be empty. So there might be use, uses for states in this. Right now, though, the match operations have no state. It's the, the state is not stored until you do the, until you actually put a, give it a result object that it can um, actually do the match in. Um, so here's an example. This is, so remember that our, uh, uh, let's go back here, the graph function, you would think the graph function would do a lot of work, right? It's building up a match, a matching function. But this is the entire graph function. It's empty. It does nothing but return an empty object. What's important about the empty object is, is that that empty object encodes the list of instructions that we are matching. And that's where all the smarts are. It's not until we actually call the match function that those smarts come into play. So the, so the, the functions that actually build up the, the pattern very tri they're trivial. They're, most of them just return an empty object. An empty object, but of a very unique type, a type that's very special. That, you know, if you were to, to, to print out the type, you know, if, or if you were to look at the object code, it, it's, you know, it can be a kilobyte of, or more of, of text, which is a bunch of nested template, whatever. Let me talk sort of shift for a moment, because we're gonna come back to that, but let me shift for a moment and talk a little bit about type traits, and specifically about explicit type traits. So you should all be familiar with type traits like isConst, which uh, are computed by the implementation. The implementation can see if something is const, and it, and it produces a true type or a false type for isConst. But type traits can also be explicitly attached to types. So for example, here we have a specialization. We have a, a, we have a concept um, in a concept in the generic programming sense, but eventually could be a concept in the langu linguistic sense of the C++ whatever version it eventually it gets into, um, that says that an operand matcher has certain qualities. And uh, we want to be able to see, see if something is an operand matcher so that we create a unary predicate uh, type trait to say, is something an operand matcher? 
Okay, so there's a very special thing, very common in uh, metaprogramming, which is the unary predicate, or the predicate unary, unary predicate uh, type trait, which is a type trait that, that produces either true type or false type, um, and has a single template argument. It says, is it one of those? It's often spelled is something. So in this case, is operand matcher. By default, it's, it's false type. So the very first line of that second, uh, first uh, uh, code block is declaring the type trait. It says, all type, for all types, uh, is operand matcher is false, except when we specialize it, or partially, special, uh, partially specialize it, as we do right, right underneath, that a register is, uh, a register matcher is a, an operand matcher, okay? So it doesn't matter what the ID of the register is, so that's a template argument, uh, but, the, but registers are specialized this way. Okay, so it specializes it for registers, says that registers for this is true type, so now if I ask of a register, is it an operand, the answer is gonna come back yes. Is it an operand matcher, yes. Another way you could do it, and there's more than these two ways, but I'll just mention this one, um, is you could use inheritance. So here, in the second code block, we declare the, the primary template for is operand matcher to match, uh, a, a, to match a type T if that type T is derived from operand matcher base. So we define a base class and we say anything derived from that base class has this trait. And then register, we declare it such that it's derived from that base class and now register is an operand matcher. Yes? Directly from some of your say-so, but only someone's type is derived directly from true type or false type, and you take a level out of your hierarchy. Yes, that's true. Um, so, I don't know if you heard that, but the, the thing is I could have put colon colon type here, and it would flatten my hierarchy, type trait hierarchy slightly. You, you, you won't really see the difference, um, except maybe a, a few nanoseconds in compilation time each time you use it. So. Uh, it may add up, it could potentially add up, and it makes the types a little uglier to print out. If you, if you get a compile time error and you're looking at the, at the instantiation stack, it might be a little cleaner that way. So, uh, are these two equivalent? Not exactly, they're, they're very close. The difference is that in the second case, everything derived from register will also be an operand matcher. Whereas in the first case, if I derive something from register, it won't be an operand matcher unless I specialize for that as well. And so which, which style you prefer might depend on whether you think that things that model these concepts in, are, are, are base classes that can be inherited from and, would also, and, the, and the drive classes would also automatically model the same concepts. Um, in our case, uh, for the limited type hierarchies that we have, it's the second case is uh, method is probably better. Anything they would derive from register is probably an operand matcher. Uh, and I could actually explicitly specialize and to, for false type if I actually break that. But, um, but the way the code is written right now, I actually use the first style and I'm thinking of switching over. But it's just a couple of different ways that you can do it. There are other ways you can do it. You can put special types inside to say if it, if it contains one of these special types, then it's one of, one of these. So there's, there's, you know, lots of ways to do it. But the important thing is it's explicit. I'm not relying on sniffing out qualities of the type to know whether it belongs to a certain uh, concept. So these are the traits that we use in, in mer matcher, uh, is opcode matcher, is operand matcher, and is pattern matcher. And you can see that although you know, there, are th there are three uh, traits, there are multiple types that uh, return true for the, each of those. Another technique that we use are compile time lists. You've probably seen these before, type lists. Um, or sometimes some people call them type sequences because they don't look like link linked lists, they look more like arrays of, of types. But most people call, call these type lists. Um, and lists of types are everywhere. Okay, an instruction is a list of, uh, 
has, has an opcode matcher and also has a list of operand matchers for inputs and another list of operand matchers for its outputs. Uh, an opcode list is a list of opcodes that could be matched. Uh, an, an instruction graph um, is a list of instructions that form a graph. So we, want to we need something like a compile time list. And uh, the things that we want to, want to see from it are things like size, how many types are in it, uh, is it empty, um, the, what's the first thing in the list, what's the rest of the list minus the first thing. Uh, for those of you who know Lisp, that would be car and cutter. Uh, and uh, an is type list um, predicate and a make type list that will generate one of these. So let's build a really simple one. Um, and for many cases, for many uses of type lists, this is sufficient. But I'm going to keep making it more sophisticated, so bear with me. A type list basically is just a variadic template that has no uh, data members. It just has these type members um, or these uh, static context for data members. So the, let's look at the second declaration first. The second declaration says, if we have a type and then some zero or more additional types, we have a non-empty type list. So um, the size of it is one plus the size of the all but the first element. Um, it's, it's not empty, so is empty is false. Uh, the first is the, the first type parameter and the rest is a type list of the rest. So wait, that's recursive, right? Well, Anything that's recursive needs some kind of base case, case, and that's what the first one is, right? So the second one is a specialization that says if we have at least one, this is the preferred specialization. And uh, the first one is we don't have at least one. That's what's left over. If you didn't match the second one, you match the first one. And it is not recursive. It does not, it's not de defined in terms of itself. And that ends your recursion, your compile time recursion. Okay, good. And of course, a type list that has no elements that doesn't have a first and it doesn't have a rest. So that makes sense. The meta functions that we were talking about is type list. Again, this is the style I mentioned before. By default, nothing is a type list. And then the second declaration in, on the screen says, except if it is a type list. All right, then we specialize and say, if, if it's a specialization of type list, then it is a type list that returns true type. The, the next thing down is our list concatenation primitives, but it's, it's an implementation detail, so I have that imp in there. And I'll show you in a minute why, why, how I use this within make, uh, make type list. All right, so uh, it's simply, uh, the, the primary template has no specializations, has no, no body. Um, it should not be instantiated on anything except type lists. So we specialize it. Uh, the second and the, the last two uh, definitions here for uh, a single type list and for two or more type lists. In the case of, again, we have a recursion here. So in the case of two or more type lists, we create a single type list, which is the concatenation of the first two. And then we recursively create a, a concatenation um, of, the, of, of the, first, the, the first two concatenated together, concatenated with the third with the third and subsequent ones, if there are any. And then our base case, case is when there are no more, we have just one type list here, and we return it unchanged. So this type list here is exactly the same as the template argument, and it ends our, our recursion. Everybody kind of clear on that? All right, so this builds, a, this builds one type list out of n other type lists. So this is for one, for one list, type list, and the other is for two or more type lists. Now, uh, I have this interesting little meta function that says, given the type T, give me a type list of T, unless T is already a type list, in which case just give me T. And that's what this whole thing does, and I'm not even gonna go into detail because you probably know what conditional is if you know it, if you've done any meta programming at all. Okay, it simply, simply is gonna give me either, either the ty uh, type list wrapped uh, T or it's going to give me um, the, the unmodified T. Okay, type list wrapped, unmodified. 
Okay, and then well, finally I can write my make type list, which says, give me a list, given the list of types and type lists, concatenate it all together into one flat type list. And this is something that I need uh, quite a bit in, the, in Mermanter. All right, so I said that sort of I was building up to something more sophisticated, because that's, this was already more sophisticated than most type lists, because it has this make type list that does this flatten thing, and uh, instead of simply concatenate two things at a time and all that. And that's because I'm, I'm getting a more, I need a more sophisticated type list for my purposes, but I need more. I need it to be uniform. Now uniform, in the metaprogramming sense, doesn't mean that they're all the same type. A vector or a list in regular uh, non-metaprogramming uh, is something that is, is uniform in that all of the elements are the same type. In, in metaprogramming, it means that they all ma model a sim a, the same concept. So for example, I want a list of operand matchers. I don't want a mixture of operand matchers and instruction matchers and things like that. So um, I need to add a predicate in here that avoids, prevents me from adding things to my list that don't belong. So my list now has an, an additional first argument, which is a predicate that every element must match. And the predicate is kind of like a, a compile time callback to the client that is, that is instantiating this template, and uh, it, it returns true um, if the member belongs to the list, should belong to the list. Right, and then we have to en enhance, make type list, such that it won't instantiate if the, uh, if the list that you give it is heterogeneous. Yeah, everything has to, has to match. Okay, and what's important here is the words in bold there, substitution will fail if something doesn't belong to the list. And that's gonna be important later on, that it's that. It's that. For what I mean by that is, it's not good enough for to statically assert. It actually has to fail to instantiate. So, it's, so it, that's a subtle difference, but really important. All right, so now I'm just gonna do a, a kind of a quick diff from what we've already seen. Um, I add the extra predicate, and notice that the predicate is itself a template template parameter, right? It takes a, it's a, it takes a template argument, and it, it produces a true type or false type. Um, the fact that it produces true type or false type, it cannot be encoded in C++ this way. Uh, eventually with concepts, maybe it can be. Um, but right now, we just say it's a template that has one template parameter, and it's a, it's a type. Okay, and then we, the, the middle line here, we is simply making the predicate available to users of this list sometime. Um, and we added this extra uh, empty list type which I'm not gonna get into as to why I bothered, um, uh, because it, it, it's a much subtler part of the, of the whole matcher framework that I don't, I'm not gonna get into in this talk. But suffice to say, it's, the, it's obviously it's the type of the empty list. It has a predicate, but no members. Now we change our as type list. We, we have to add the predicate, and we, and, uh, up to here, everything, all the uses of the predicate are pretty straightforward. Uh, but there's this additional Boolean argument here, which uh, evaluates, says that the, the type T should either be a type list with the same predicate, or, um, or it should be uh, a, an, a single, an object that belongs to our type list. That, that, and if, and if this returns false, if this evaluation returns false, we get this specialization here, which is more specialized than, the, than this one, and therefore gives us something different. So by default, we get well, the same thing we had before, which is that if it's a type list, we return it unchanged, and if it's not a type list, we wrap it into a, and make it into a type list. But the new specialization here that says, if it doesn't match our predicate, we get this empty class, means that there's no type member. And, the, fit, and the, the lack of that type member is key to, in, in Sphenite terms, um, the, uh, making it fail to instantiate. If you try to use the type member, one none exists. So our, 
our, our opera, and, um, uh, okay, this is going a step further, okay. So is everybody kind of clear on this concept here, okay. So this, this empty class is a, is a classic way of causing something to fail to compile or fail to, to match um, when you specialize it in a certain way. We're gonna go one step further with our type list because type lists are too simple and we need to make them complicated. Uh, it turns out that I have a number of things in my uh, template system that need to act as type lists, but they're not just type lists, they have other things in them. So I want to in somehow inherit all of the type list qualities. And so I modify my type list to make it a base class and I use the curiously recurring template pattern so that the members of that base class, things like first and, and uh, well rest especially, are uh, of the appropriate type. So here's our curiously recurring parameter, um, and then our predicate that we already had before, so we now have two extra arguments at the beginning, but then back to our list of elements. I'm not gonna get into the details of how this works, but you can kind of figure that out. The important thing is that um, I can now inherit, for example, operand matcher list from this type list base, and now operand and matcher list has all of the qualities I need to be able to concatenate lists and things like that. I can call make type list on it and it'll do the right thing. All right, we're about to get cute. Um, the reason this picture of this is a baby hedgehog, in case you didn't know, is, is in here is because I was told that every presentation can be improved by having a picture of a baby hedgehog. <laughs> but we are about to get cute because we're going to overload operator comma. <clears throat> Now, I see Alistair is like, he did a face palm when I said this. Why is it okay to overload operator comma here? Because we are completely uh, stealing our syntax for other purposes. We are basically, we're using operator equal for something different. We're using function calls for something different. What we're doing is we're, we're instead of actually doing an assignment when we see the equal, or doing a function call when we see the function call, the, the, the uh, parenthesis operator, is we are building up some kind of data structure, actually at compile time. And so, so operator comma is no different from any other syntactic uh, mechanism you, you've got, so why not? All right, why do we need operator comma? We need operator comma because sometimes an instruction may have more than one output. So we have here a, uh, a fictitious division operator, the, uh, division instruction that returns both the quotient and the remainder in two separate registers. And we need to be able to re represent two, two registers now on the left hand side, and how do we do that? Well, this syntax more or less pretty much corresponds uh, relatively closely to the dump syntax of the LLVM IR that I showed earlier for what it looks like when you have two, two registers on the left. And they are separated by a comma, and there we have a comma operator. Okay, how does that look? Well, it looks pretty darn simple, right? We have our comma operator that says we have two operands and we're gonna produce a operand list, right? Make, make type list, we're, pass, we're saying we want an operand matcher list, and we're passing it to two operands. Simple overload, and this is exactly the body of the function. It just returns the empty object. Okay, there should be something that should scare you a little bit about this. We are overloading operator comma with a template, and we're not constraining the operands at all. So what prevents this from matching int for one of the operands, for example? or string or something else that doesn't belong here and suddenly everything matches our operator comma. Well, there's two things. First of all, it's nested in a namespace. But that's not even our big protection. Our big protection is that make type list will fail to the substitution failure if one of the operands is not an operand matcher. So this works only for operand matchers, period, that's it. Otherwise, it does, the overload is completely skipped over. Pretty cool. And all of that was in the infrastructure of the type list. So I can 
create type lists of whatever using operator comma or operator plus or operator um, you know, double pipe for, for ors or, or amper to amper, and I don't have to worry about creating type lists that they have the wrong things in them because they just won't match. Wait, we've been talking about compile time. Doesn't anything happen at runtime? Yeah, of course. Of course something happens at runtime. After our data structure is built up, it has a member function in it that is called by the match function that does this work here of saying, well, given a set of registers that have already been matched, we find the instructions that are on the other end of those registers, that consume those registers or that produce those registers, and we look at those to see if they match the next thing in our instruction, and we do this recursively with that backtracking such that, you know, if we find, if we get, go down the, the, the rosy path, the primrose path of, uh, of matching, and then suddenly we end up with a non-match, we backtrack, <laughs> try the next thing, and, and, and recursively go from there. All of that happens, of course, at runtime. Question? <laughs> I, I won't comment on whether I've embedded prolog. Um, I definitely embedded Lisp, though, because you always have to embed Lisp. This is the, the core uh, recursive matching logic. The stuff in, at the beginning, at the, the, the ellipsis up there, there is more in here, but all of that's compile time. There's a whole bunch of types that are declared where we're extracting firsts and register sets and things like that. This is the core of what's happening at runtime. Now, it doesn't look like very much code, and it's not, but remember it's recursive, and it's recursive on the template level, so when it recurses, it's a different instantiation. So it's gonna generate a lot more code than what it looks like here. Okay, nevertheless, it will not generate more code than you would by hand, or at least not much more. So, there's a lot more that happens at compile time but there's not enough time to talk about it. Funny how I knew that when I wrote this talk. Um, I actually didn't know that. I had to give it a dry run, and I said, nope, not that time. <laughs> so every part of the pattern matching system keeps track of a set of registers that should have been matched by now. And it does that all at compile time. It keeps this bit set of registers that could be matched. That's why the registers had to be, you know, simple numbers like one, two, three, four, five. They have to be small numbers smaller than 64 because 64 is the, the maximum that I could fit in my uh, little register, compile time register set. Um, the matching order is important. That is, if I match a certain instruction, the next instruction I match has to come from a limited set that is connected to one of the instructions that has already been matched. And how do I make sure that happens? I have to do a sort, and I do this sort at compile time, and I really wanted to show you that because I wanted to show off, but I don't have time. When these slides become available, and I will make them available, um, you can look at the end. I have a few slides where I started to sort of explain how that works. And then you could look at the code and compare it to the slides and maybe figure it out. Uh, we barely touched on sort of the partial, what the pattern, partial pattern matchers actually do, like when you actually get to the level of matching an instruction. But it's really pretty self-explanatory. Like an instruction is the opcode matches what, we, what we're looking for, and the uh, the operands match what they're looking for, that is, this should be a register, this should be an immediate, immediate operand, and things like that. Um, and whenever an instruction is matched, we have to actually store the results somewhere, so we have that result structure, and there is this uh, lookup of instructions and lookup of registers that, that converts our unique types, the register types um, and instruction types, into numbers that are used in the lookup. There's ongoing work, this is, pretty early days, it's not available publicly yet, although I will show you a GitHub repository where it'll go soon. Um, and uh, so I won't go through all of the things I'm gonna do, but there's things that are, uh, there are improvements to be made. We use operator overloading, so in conclusion, to get this embedded language. Every talk I've seen so far about it, little embedded languages, and I've seen several at CPPCon, uh, this time, CPPCon 2018, use operator overloading something like what we've got here. Um, context for functions, operators, uh, operators and uh, uh, context for variables, um, alias templates, and type traits, all of these come from C++11, so you really hard, have a hard time doing this in C++98, but it's not completely impossible. You just have to probably use a few more macros. And 
you, can, you can build some reusable tools. So type list, I'm actually planning to break out into sort of a reusable package of kind of uniform type lists. The, the, the basic type list may or may not be something that should be used by itself, but the uniform type list is kind of interesting. These are advanced techniques. So I told you at the beginning, you know, I gave you all these warnings and made you, you know, tried to, make, tried to scare you and none of you laughed anyway. Um, and I hope that you've actually learned something from this talk. But all of those warnings are not to tell you don't do it. Go ahead and do it. You learn a lot. I learned a lot about C++11 from doing this, this exercise. There's a few references. The GitHub thing is empty right now. There's just a readme file saying nothing here. But I hope within the week, and certainly by the time that the YouTube video uh, comes out, to have code up there. There's some other talks at CPVCon 2018. Unfortunately, the first three have already passed, so you're going to have to wait for the YouTube video to come out. Um, I really, really, really recommend Hannah's talk about the regular expressions. It is so cool what she did. It, it's this kind of stuff, but even bumped to the next level of, of quality uh, in terms of the code uh, and what it produces. Uh, there is one left in terms of the ones I called out, and there are others about metaprogramming, but the last one here, um, we'll talk a little bit about metaprogramming tricks. I, I do not know uh, what's, what's in store there, but it sounds like it would be, if you're interested in this talk, you might be interested in that one. And the Boost Spirit library is another kind of parsing library that is already out there for you to play with, where you can actually build um, parsers at compile time. Um, using similar techniques to what I showed here. So with that, uh, I open it up to questions. Thank you. Peter, there's a microphone here so that it gets recorded. Um, no, no, I do use, I do, I do do that. Um, I, I, there may have been some places in the slide where I could have used it and didn't. Um, that was just an oversight on my part. There's also a number of places where we missed it in 2000, in, in, in C++ 11 and fixed it in, in, in C++ 14, where the, the underscore T alias didn't exist in the standard. But yes, I could have done that here. I didn't want to show the extra step of creating the template alias because, because slide space, you know. But yes, uh, but I use template aliases. That is like one of the key tools to make this whole thing work is template aliases, or alias templates, so sorry, to be precise. Yes. Um, so the first part of the question, no, I did not actually take a measurement of the compile time. Um, I do not think it is excessive, um, mostly because these patterns tend to be small. Those two, for example, two instruction patterns, a lot of the patterns are just two instructions. Um, I, I do plan to, at some point, do that kind of measurement. I really don't know. Um, nor do I know the effect on performance either and the, number, the size, the code size. Uh, and that's hard to measure because uh, the LLVM infrastructure, you know, I can't just throw, throw it all into Godbolt and take care of that. Um, the other part of the question was using uh, other, other tools like things in Boost. And no, this, is, this started out as kind of, um, let me see how far I can go. And then I got something that worked kind of cool and then I discovered that there were other things out there that did parts of what I'm doing. And I, it definitely is worth my researching things like, like Spirit and other things uh, that, that might actually uh, feed in here. Like maybe I don't need that whole type list infrastructure and so on. I think we have time for one more. <laughs> Easy to not be able to instantiate if you have, let's say, an extra 
pointed at this keyboard because the printer doesn't match. And Good. he had one the predicate where he had class only. Yeah. And yes. Three dots are missing. Right. No, good. That's a that's a that's a good point. It worked fine for me because I know all of my own predic all the predicates I care about. But in terms of making it a general purpose utility, I agree that would be a, a good improvement. Thank you. All right. So uh, the clock says that I'm out of time. So thanks again for for coming. Um, I can stand around for just a little while longer and answer more questions if you want. But uh, that's it for the formal part of the talk. Thank you.